Okay, hi, thanks for coming. My name is Michael Lucas, and I'm here to talk about running web services on OpenBSD. And this is kind of an overview to acquaint you with what they've got and what it can do. Uh, we're not going to go terribly deep into some parts of it because we only have an hour. Uh, my main goal is to show you that this can be done. It works quite well. And the things you know are probably mostly applicable already to it. So I've been a sysadmin now for 20 years. If you are ever in Southeast Michigan, you should stop by the Southeast Michigan BSD user group. Uh, we even welcome Patrick, so you, all of you would be just fine there. <laughs> I, write, I write a whole bunch of books on different things, and uh, my 29th book is RelayD and HTTPD Mastery which is the OpenBSD web stack. And a special gravy just for today. Uh, Rake is in the front row here. He wrote most of this software uh, with assistance from an entire peanut gallery of characters. So uh, I'm sure he will be shocked to find out some of the things I said in the book. OK, let's talk about the web. Um, how many of you know people that think the web is the internet? You know, and, and really, I would say, in some ways, the web is everything that's wrong with the internet. Well, okay, there was Usenet. Usenet was kind of a sewer, but, you know, that mostly these are the things that are really wrong with the internet. And, okay, fine, mailing lists. Mailing lists are crap, too. Um, the point is that no matter what we do, no matter what we try, uh, the internet is used for all kinds of things that we never really intended when we put it together. And some of these have stuck around far longer than they should have, and we're, we're still kind of stuck living with them. And, and there's a really common pattern to dealing with all of these different tools and all of these different protocols. Someone says, this is terrible. I'm going to write a simple tool to deal with it. Oh, this is beautiful. This is genius. Here's, let me make a contribution to your code base. Here's a new feature. Because um, features are wonderful. And the software becomes more popular, and people send more features, and feature, 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 feature. And eventually, the whole world goes, this is terrible. This is awful. And what we really need is a simple tool to do this thing. And you may hear about you know, waterfall development and agile development and such. But really, this is the real world software development life cycle right here. This is what we actually do. Um, OpenBSD folks kind of, um, they're kind of like the uh, William F. Buckley of the software world. They stand astride the software life cycle and say, stop! You know, th this is good enough. We're going to do one tool that does this job and this is all it does and we're not adding Perl regex support into it because that would just be insane. Um, Tedu actually has a lovely article, if you haven't read it, you should, called Features Are Faults. Uh, the more you add to code, the harder it is to maintain, and the harder it is to do the simple thing that you want to do with this tool. Um, I have a Leatherman. Leatherman is a lovely tool. I carry it with me everywhere, it's in my laptop bag, but the truth is, if you know, if we're here in this room and someone breaks their glasses, I will get out my Leatherman and I will pry out that one tiny blade that's inconveniently placed and help you screw it back together. But if, if I'm doing serious work, 
I'm going into the basement and I'm getting a real screwdriver and a real hammer and using real dedicated tools. So, and OpenBSD has a bunch of stuff that does this. There's the HTTPD web server, which just for the record is my only serious complaint about the web stack. Because if you go to Google and you ask for help with HTTPD, you're basically doomed. Uh, so add some, like an OpenBSD into your query uh, and make sure you're only looking for results from the last couple of years because the old OpenBSD HTTPD was Apache. Uh, there's the RelayD proxy and redirector. Uh, CARP provides IP layer redundancy. There's the PF packet filter and all of this is built on top of LibreSSL. It is. Yes, PF is built on top of LibreSSL. Deal. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Henning did not know this. I'm okay with that. Um, <laughs> ah, bloody Germans. Okay. Yeah, wait, whatever. Uh, I'm from the States. It's all Europe. Who cares? <laughs> Okay, the software is all, um, the, the server applications, are you happy Henning, uh, are all written with LibreSSL, uh, LibreSSL APIs, not OpenSSL APIs. Uh, they're doing some work on RelayD to bring it into that state now. And all of this stuff hooks into PF. This means if you don't have LibreSSL, if you don't have PF, you don't get this stack of applications. Uh, so you can run this on OpenBSD. It comes out of the box. You can use a FreeBSD derivative that uses them, such as TrueOS, HardenBSD. You can build your uh, FreeBSD with a custom package repository. Uh, I suspect that someone is going to port these programs to Linux or HPUKES or whatever. I have no idea what compromises or changes they will make. So just be aware the farther you get away, the more interesting your results may be. More features. Oh, but you certainly get more features, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so HTTPD is a very simple web server. Um, it, the configuration is reminiscent of Nginx, other OpenBSD programs. Uh, it's basically made up of a, a ch root in var www. Uh, there's a config file at chttpd.conf, and it runs most dynamic things through fast CGI. If you look at an HTTPD configuration file, this is all very, very s simple. You assign a macro for a public IP. Here we define a virtual server. This one, mallard.info. We include another configuration file. We define an alias for this server so that if someone's browser asks for www.mallard.info or just mallard.info, they get directed to this site. We listen to our public IP on port 80. And we define a root directory that contains the documents for the site. This is very simple. Now, if you compare this to an Apache configuration file, yes, the, the configuration for a single virtual server in Apache might be very small. But the configuration for Apache itself is several hundred lines before that. And if one of them is incorrect or out of order, you're basically doomed. So, or you just throw all of that out and you copy in the default configuration and who knows what it does, but it works so fine. So, HTTPD also lets you do per location rules. So, here we say directory auto index. If there's no index file in the directory, create one. But in this location, in this files directory, 
don't create an index. In this location, uh, anyone who tries to go to anything in this secret directory, we require them to authenticate against uh, an HT password file. So HTTPD has a default server that listens by default on all IP addresses. If a client pokes at that IP with their web browser, uh, but doesn't, the client doesn't provide a host name, they get the default site, which is in var docs. Uh, you can also do blocks and redirects. Uh, HTTPD does not do rewrites, but it does do redirects. So here we basically say, if someone comes and looks for our RSS XML feed, uh, return a 302 code and tell them where to go instead. Um, the second example, what we've done is we're using a couple of macros that HTTPD replies to say if you come to this site on port 80, uh, return a 301 code to the HTTPS version of the same page. So we're, we're just transparently saying, turn on SSL and come back. You can also use globs in the configuration file. Uh, maybe you have multiple web servers. Uh, you might have servers 0 through 9. And you just want all of them to be directed here, so you can just copy the configuration across all the servers. Uh, that can be convenient. You can also use wildcards. Uh, any host name in mallard.info, this server answers, as well as uh, this mallard.info alias. The wildcard does not match the plain domain name, because you have this little period here. So, um, and as I recall, you, if you put HTTP colon slash slash period domain name, the web browser gives you a fit. Um, you can also do character classes just like in a shell. How many of you know and loathe Perl regexes? How many of you don't know Perl regexes but that know that they just need loathing? OK. Um, they decide that the, the code to do Perl regexes is, is as, I un, as I recall, larger than the code of HTTPD. So, and Rake hasn't like given me the look that I'm an idiot, so I'm going to go with that statement. Uh, instead, uh, of using Perl regexes, HTTPD uses Lua patterns, which are kind of regexy. They use a lot of the same syntax and same characters, but they exclude some of the features that make regex so infuriating. And in a HTTPD config, you identify them with uh, the match keyword which we'll illustrate with several hundred examples. But this is what a, a, a Lua character class and pattern looks like. Uh, most of the special classes start with a percent sign, so you can match you know, all digits, all letters, all printable characters. You can match specific characters. I have something against the letter Q, so here's a character class that excludes it. You can use uh, the asterisk and the plus wild cards that you're all familiar with by now. You can anchor to the front and end of a string. And really, when it comes to regexes for configuration, um, this is what most of us really use in the real world. Conveniently, Lua has a BSD or MIT license, so that was on the issue. 
Okay. So it's not lure itself, but it's the sea back end of it. Okay, it's a, it's a slice of actual lure, of actual lewd DNA. Cool. Um, so, uh, logs. How many of you use the traditional Apache log? How many of you use the Apache combined log format? How many of you have devised, have devised and custom tailored your own very special Apache configuration? Okay, Adam is out of luck. Um, HTTPD supports three different types of logs. The Apache traditional, the combined log that almost everybody uses, uh, and it also does a RelayD style log, which comes from HTTPD's roots in RelayD. Um, oh, and the logs go inside the ch root in a log directory. You can uh, set it on a per site basis or just dump them all together. It depends on whatever's least horrifying to you. Uh, some usual debugging you might expect, minus n will test the configuration before you restart. Uh, you can test alternate config files. And you can also run HTTPD in the foreground and it will spit out exactly what it's doing so that you can see how what you told HTTPD to do is not what you intended for it to do and that's why it's doing what it's doing. So, dynamic content. Uh, these days, everything is dynamic. Uh, HTTPD uses the fast CGI interface. OpenBSD comes with slow CGI. And there are others in ports collection if you have a favorite deal. Uh, if you get 500 errors on your website, that means that the fast CGI server is not running. Uh, don't spend a couple hours beating your head against your keyboard, desperately trying to figure out why this is. Not that I have ever done that. So, um, basically, all you do to configure it, you define a location. The asterisk is saying anything in this directory. The, if you give just the trailing slash, as I recall, you're saying just the directory. The asterisk is this and, every, and whatever else comes after. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You can also say location match as well and use a match. Yes, you can use a match there. Uh, So you just say, hey, look at the fast CGI here. So we're going to, how does a CH rooted web server work? Um, the plus side is the web server can only access stuff in var dub dub dub. The downside is the web server can only access stuff in var dub dub dub. Um, on the whole, this is definitely a gain. If you're trying to run a Perl CGI in HTTPD, it, you, may have to do a little work here. You may, if you're running a complicated application like WordPress, you'll want to put in a hosts file, a resolve.conf, probably local time. Remember, you can't symlink out of a ch root. Um, but if you have a binary you want to use, use LDD to identify which shared libraries it needs. So. I'm going to, WordPress is, is one of the most popular frameworks for building web pages, so I used it as an example in the book. I'm sorry. I, I know a lot of people can't stand it, but if you can run WordPress, you have a real web server, 
and nobody can say otherwise. So uh, OpenBSD uses MariahDB instead of MySQL because Oracle. Uh, choose whichever PHP version you want. Enable it in uh, rc.conf. Some things you need to do since the server is ch rooted. Uh, you need a MySQL socket in the ch root. And you have to tell MariahDB about this socket. Uh, when you install PHP modules on OpenBSD, you get sample config files. They're not activated. You need to copy them, copy them from the sample directory to the production directory and make any changes that you find necessary and start the PHP FPM module, which is the, the PHP fast CGI processor. And so here we've got a, a complete working WordPress httpd.conf. Listens on a port, has a directory index, and if it's a file that ends in PHP, we send it to FastCGI on our special PHP FPM socket. You can't run PHP on slow CGI. It, it, it does not work well. OK. That's an overview of HTTPD. Ah, TLS, SSL. How many of you still run SSL? How many of you still call it SSL? Oh, that's the next question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah most people call it SSL. It isn't really, not anymore. Um, transport layer security has replaced secure sockets layer, and it's uh, still in need of improvement, but it is um, less appalling. So, OpenBSD includes solutions for doing TLS. Some things to remember, uh, TLS only protects data in transit. I'm saying this mostly for the people watching at home. Turning on TLS does not make your website secure. Uh, if you're running some horrible custom in-house app, adding TLS is not special security pixie dust. Uh, the hacker will just change his web browser to point to HTTPS and continue ripping his merry way into your customer database. So. Uh, TLS works on a certificate authority system, which uh, basically there's an outside trusted entity that issues you a certificate that says who you are. Uh, this is not a good system. And the scope of just how not good it is is beyond the amount of time we have left in BSD CAN, so I'm not going to go into it. But there is a way to make it more useful for those of us in the real world. Uh, Let's Encrypt is a scripted automated certificate authority. It is a joint project of the Linux Foundation and, and someone else. Uh, it wasn't the EFF. They had security in their name. but ISRG, thank you. And basically, it's free SSL certs for everyone. It works by, veri by verifying the only thing TLS really does for you. It verifies that you control the host. Uh, and it does this through DNS entries or HTTP entries. Uh, through something called the Automated Certificate Management Environment or Acme. As a Wile E. Coyote fan, I find this somehow perfectly sensible. Uh, OpenBSD's Acme client uh, automates certificate renewal. There are many clients for Let's Encrypt. Uh, so far, Acme client is the nicest one I have seen. And Let's Encrypt certs are good for 90 days. Realistically, you need to automate 
certificate renewal. You should have done this all along anyway, but it was hard and annoying with ACME. It's easy and qu fairly quick. And that slide shouldn't have been there, and I've been meaning to cut it out for the last two times I've given this talk, and I forget about it every time. So, how ACME works. Uh, first time you run the client, it creates an account key pair with Let's Encrypt. Uh, when you want to create a certificate, ACME client asks the ACME certificate authority what proof it will accept that you have control of the, do of the domain. Let's Encrypt accepts HTTP-based and DNS-based uh, proof. The client gets to choose among the supported options. Uh, Acme client just uses HTTP. Acme client creates a certificate signing request and sends it to Let's Encrypt. Uh, Let's Encrypt says, if you really control this domain, create this file in a hidden directory on your website. Uh, Acme client creates the file. It signs that file with its account key. Uh, Let's Encrypt checks to see if that file is there. And if the file is there, the client controls the site. And it signs the CSR and returns it to uh, the client. So, uh, and to configure your web server to validate or to provide ACME responses is this five lines in httpd.conf. That's it. So there's a configuration file, of course, etsy acmeclient.conf. And each domain needs a few things. Uh, the main site name, alternative names. You can have as many alternative names as you want. Some certificate authorities, sorry, some certificates I've seen in the wild have dozens of host names in one certificate. This is usually so they can buy one cert and service all of their clients. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, you have to tell Acme Client where to put the key, where to put the certificate, uh, where to put the chain certificate, which is basically all of the intermediate CAs, and then tell it to sign with Let's Encrypt. So, first time you run Acme Client, create an account key with minus A to get an actual cert that you have configured. Uh, Acme Client minus D. The minus V flag tells you, makes it more verbose. The first time you run it, I would tell you to add a couple minus Vs, read the output, see what it's actually doing. It's illuminating. Also, uh, if something goes wrong, add some minus Vs. See what it's doing. It's illuminating. <coughs> if you did something like accidentally remove the validation directory from your website config, uh, that's where you find out. TLS and httpd.conf, uh, again, I'd invite you to compare this with Apache. Here is a complete SSL site. Instead of, instead of a statement that says, listen on port 80, you have TLS, or listen on uh, whatever address, with TLS on this port. So you can easily run TLS on port 80 if you want really everyone to hate you. And I have sites I'm good with that. You define a certificate, define a key file, and that's it. Uh, the HSTS line here sounds really good. It's hot host strict transport security, meaning once you've talked to the site over SSL, never talk to it over unencrypted connections. Be really sure that everything really works uh, before you turn that on. Because if you screw up and you have to try to get to that site again without SSL, your browser will refuse. Other browsers will refuse. 
Uh, and the only way to get rid of that is to flush the client cache. So renewing these certificates is highly, highly challenging and requires extensive shell script automation. You run Acme Client with the domain name and it sees if it needs renewing. If, it ha if Acme Client has renewed the script, sorry, renewed the cert, reload HTTPD, tell it to read the file again. Okay, how many of you have used online certificate status protocol? We have a few hands. BSD CAN is officially hardcore. Um, whenever you contact a, a TLS protected site, uh, the browser goes to the certificate authority and says, can you please verify that this certificate has not yet been revoked? And the certificate authority says, yes, that certificate is still valid, you may proceed. So on some of these sites where you have, uh, thanks to JavaScript and tracking and whatnot, you may have an SSL website with 30 domain names in it, each with their own cert. And it's reaching, your browser is reaching out to all of the, for all of these domains to get the, the answers. And that can slow things down quite a bit. OCSP lets the web server send a request to the, uh, to the, red, to the CA saying, can you give me a really short-lived certificate that says I haven't been revoked yet? So uh, this lets you, when the client comes to your TLS protected website, the client gets a certificate and the very short-lived OCSP certificate. It's good for a week. Uh, and this way they don't have to go talk to the registrar sorry, to the CA, and this can considerably improve performance of your TLS website. A lot of sites that are, uh, uh, yes, was that? Yeah. Oh. Many, generally speaking, last time I checked, I hope this has changed. Most browsers still look for CSRs. Sorry, certificate revocation lists. Too many ac acronyms. And this is my third day at BSD CAN, acronym overload, sorry. Yes, most browsers still check. I hope I'm wrong. Yes, OCSP checking is beneficial in most cases today. And it's very simple to configure in, you just need one line in your HTTPD that says, hey, I have OCSP. Um, you have to check each, uh, the certificates expire weekly, so in your daily check to see if your cert needs renewing, you just add a line that says, hey, can you uh, give me a new cert? And it will renew it after, I think it's three, once it's three days old, I believe. So some other things you can do with HTTPD. Note that can do is not the same as should do. Um, it is possible to do things like change TCP behavior in HTTPD.conf. I do not know why you would do this, but presumably you like pain, so fine. Uh, you can set the IP time to live, which is actually useful. If you want to guarantee that your website is not visible more than two hops from the server, say uh, your firewall team has difficulty with such things, and you want to control this at the server, not that I've ever been here, 
um, and, and done such a thing, but changing the IPTTL will fix this problem for you. Um, you can play with the TLS versions and ciphers. Again, don't muck with ciphers unless there's a, a real definite reason to, such as um, the boss says do it or you will stop getting a paycheck. That, that's a valid reason. But, you know, write down your objections and it'll, it'll be useful when the inevitable disaster hits. Um, if you have users with websites, put their home directories inside the ch root. So, RelayD, and I need to, uh, okay, I'm, I'm doing okay for time. RelayD, now let, let's talk about PF load balancing. PF has a built-in load balancer, and the load balancer is very nice. You can have a PF box and a bunch of web servers behind it and have PF redirect traffic to all of those servers and that's grand and beautiful except that it is completely fault oblivious. If one of those web servers disappears, PF does not care. Uh, that's not PF's job. Remember, small tools that do a simple thing. So, RelayD comes in where it, it tests hosts to see if they should receive traffic. And then they can, it can adjust the PF tables accordingly and add and remove hosts that should accept traffic. RelayD can also act as a layer 7 proxy. It can accept TCP connections for you, examine what's inside them, muck with it, and create a new connection on inward. So, for either of these functions, start with a PF firewall. Uh, you need packet forwarding. You want to make sure that your untrusted host can't connect to the firewall, etc. All the things that you would do to lock down a firewall. You know, open telnet to the world, etc. So, and then we can look at RelayD on top of it. RelayD has got four pieces. Uh, it's privilege separated, so it has a parent process that can run as root. There is a host check engine that pokes each possible recipient of traffic and says, hey, are you there? Uh, there's a PF engine that talks to PF, and there's a relay engine that will accept and create connections. And everything is controlled through relay control. So, simplest type of a, of a relay is a redirection, which is basically talk to PF. We have a table here of web servers, and these are possible candidates for receiving traffic. We define a redirect where we listen on the outside address on port 80 on this interface, and RelayD wants to forward to host in the table and it does an HTTP check for, you know, basically get slash, and it expects to return an HTTP code 200. If a target server returns that, it may receive traffic. If a target server returns anything except a code 200, it is removed from the PF table. Like everything else, uh, in OpenBSD, RelayD takes macros. I like using macros in configs. Macros are fun. Macros, uh, macros can cause problems, but the problems caused by macros are far fewer than the problems caused by not using macros. So it's a win. Relay control shows you what your running RelayD process is doing, what redirects are running, what hosts are there, how available are they, are they up at the moment, things like that. It can do, the, let's talk about the host checking, host check engine. You can ping it, you can check a TCP port, HTTP responses, you can do all of that over TLS, and you can also check file integrity. 
some more complicated things like exchange arbitrary data. Sure, you can connect to the mail server on port 25, but is anything actually answering on the port? Or is the kernel just accepting the connection and letting you hang? Well, here, I'm checking my mail server. When I connect to port 25, I expect to get this 220 code and then a bunch of stuff I don't care about. So the second line, um, I'm actually checking with an external script that uh, it's checking DNS. And basically, we, we dig a particular domain name at whatever server we're testing. We grep to see if we have this string in it. And if it returns that, good. It remains in the pool. If not, that name server is kaput uh, with two Ts because there's a lot of Germans involved. So relays. Relays accept connections. Examine the traffic and then create a new connection onto the destination. And they can filter based on what's in the traffic. For example, here we have a uh, SSH relay where we're listening on this host, on this port, and we forward to a host, port 22, and we, we apply this protocol called fix-up. You have to define a protocol before you use it. Um, here we've, def actually you have to define all the protocols before you define the relays. Uh, here we tell, we modify the TCP characteristics to add no delay to the new connection. Has anyone ever used SSH without no delay? Yeah. Oh, sorry, interactive SSH without no delay. You should try it sometime. It's highly educational about what no delay really does for you. And relays let you do some odd things. For example, my web developer swears that his application uses no HTTP gets. I'm wondering if he's right. So I've defined, you know, this filter. I'm sorry, he says that his application only uses gets. So fine, he, it's, he's allowed method get, any other HTTP method, the relay returns an error that says, no, you can't do that. Um, he's requested that we install PHP MyAdmin for his use because he doesn't want to use the Mar MariahDB command line for whatever reason. And that's fine, but I don't want him accessing it from outside the organization. So our outside facing relay looks for that URL and returns an error. It blocks it and returns a, a error that I have chosen to the user in their browser. Um, how many people have used WebSocket? WebSockets are basically a method of, in, in, if I'm going to be really unfair, uh, re-implementing TCP IP inside HTTP. And when I first heard of this, I said, that's kind of odd and weird, and why would you do that? So I tried browsing the, browsing the internet, blocking them. And that was also highly educational as to just how many web apps are re-implementing TCP IP inside HTTP. Um, and one day my web developer has really ticked me off. So I just remove all the user agents from all of the HTTP requests. So you can have all kinds of funs with relays. You can, however, also do useful things. For example, put SSL on your RelayD box. I've defined this protocol. When this, uh, when this request header, uh, sorry, when the request comes in, 
we append a couple of headers. We use macros. Whenever you forward TLS, you have to add these into your uh, 10 minutes. Excellent. Um, and here, the, uh, the example that RelayD.conf gives in uh, OpenBSD tells you to close each connection after the request. And I've heard people argue that one way and another. And I don't care to argue about it. Do whatever causes you less agony. Um, here we've set a bunch of TCP options inside the new connection. Some things about RelayD. Uh, they do not yet support SNI. Uh, they should by 6.2, I believe. However, should is one of those wonderful words that... Um, but they're actively working on that. Um, you can enable and disable client renegotiations, second t session tickets, etc. You can do high availability with CARP. And we have t really about five minutes because I have to run across the hall. So I'd like to open this for questions. Um, but before I take questions, I need to make this trip tax deductible. I write books, including this book here on Relay D. So, you know, uh, buy books. So let's have questions. And dear IRS, you can bite me. So any questions? I'll be happy to forward them to Rake. Adam, yes. Is there any, is it even possible that we will see a Relay D portable? Uh, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there a port in, well, that's a specific port in previous, I don't know. Um, but that's not really portable. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. Maybe it's, it's easier to port HTTP. Relay D has so many open more likely that there will be an HTTPD portable. And I had a few people who wanted to do it, but they always didn't do it. I need a Garrett Tucker kind of person to make it, who is doing the openness and they support the portable. OK. Any other questions? You, many of you have questions. You just don't want to raise your hands right now. So I'm going to say, you know, Rake is around all weekend. Feel free to ask him. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Enjoy BSD Camp. <laughs>